Good morning, church. I want to welcome you on this second Sunday of the season of Easter to our video recording of sermon and time to be together to worship. I'm going to begin today by reading our gospel lesson, uh, the Holy Gospel, according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today I would like to do something a little bit different. I'd like to invite our children for a children's sermon. I haven't done this in a while, and I just felt the need to be able to to share with our kids. And so today, boys and girls, I want to talk to you about uh, believing. Did you realize there's a very interesting book that is called Believe It or Not? It was written by Robert Ripley. And Mr. Ripley enjoyed collecting sort of strange and amazing bits of information, which when you first hear about it, it sounds unbelievable. Let me share a few examples for you. He tells, uh, in his book, he tells a story about a, a farmer who had a chicken who, uh, well, I've got an egg here. You know what an egg is. He had a, this farmer had a chicken who laid an egg that was perfectly square. Now, I've seen eggs, and just like the one I held up and showed you, we know what an egg looks like. I'd have to believe, I'd have to see before I could believe this was a square egg. And in his book, he tells another story, too. A story about a 15-year-old girl out in California who was able to take hula hoops. You know what a hula hoop is. She put 68 of them around her body, and she was able to keep them spinning round and round and round. Well, you know what? That sounds kind of wild. I'd have to see that to believe it. Here's another one. Do you know how long the longest hot dog that has ever been made? Do you know how long it was? The longest hot dog ever made was over 3,000 feet. It weighed 885 pounds and it took 103 people to be able to carry it. That's a lot of hot dog, isn't it, boys and girls? I would have to see it to believe it. Today in our gospel lesson, 
we read that on the Sunday that Jesus rose from the grave, that he appeared to his disciples, but one of his disciples, Thomas, wasn't there when he appeared to the rest. And when the disciples told Thomas about Jesus, he said, oh, I have to see this to believe it. I've got to touch the scars in his hands and his side. I want to see it with my own eyes. Well, a week later, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples, and Thomas was there that time. Jesus told Thomas, put your hands on the scars. See that I am alive. And then Thomas did believe. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are the people who believe and who never have yet seen me. A lot of people today believe that Jesus, Jesus really rose from the grave, but they haven't seen him with their own two eyes. And you know what? They're able to believe it because they have faith. God has given them faith in their heart. We accept the fact that Jesus is alive by faith, and that is a gift that God has given to you and me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you help us accept by faith that you have risen from the grave and that you are alive. We ask that you help us to always believe in Jesus' name. Amen. And now for our adults, Easter to our sermon. Not long ago, I read an article in a minister's magazine uh, written by the Reverend Paul Jones, and there he described something quite interesting. He described the ticketing system for stagecoaches in the old Wild West. And believe it or not, even in those tiny, tight, uncomfortable, horse-drawn boxes on wheels, there was a class system. Passengers bought one of three types of tickets. And during most of the journey, there was no difference. It was only if a difficulty arose during the trip that the class system of the tickets began to kick in. And here's how it worked. In case of an accident or, say, a breakdown, first-class passengers could remain in their seats. Those who held a second-class ticket were expected to get out of the coach and stand back, sort of get out of the way while they dealt with the problem. Those holding a third-class ticket not only had to disembark from the stage coach, they also had to lend a hand with the repairs or with the lifting of the stagecoach out of whatever predicament it had gotten itself into. Interesting. In our gospel, in this lesson for today, Jesus' disciples, soon to be apostles, they learned what sort of ticket they had for their ride on this Kingdom of God Express. You know, up until now, they have they had a, a first or a second class ticket, sort of sort of along for the ride as such, mostly staying out of the way, watching Jesus. But on the evening of the first Easter, Jesus gave them their third class tickets, and he made it clear to them that they had work to do in the kingdom of God. As they gathered in their hiding place, the disciples, let's sort of picture this. They were a disrupted, confused, and fearful community. The events of the past week had completely overwhelmed them. Their brains and their bodies, oh man, they were on, on an emotional overload. The scripture states that they were full of fear. And the Greek word here is phobon, from which we get our English word phobia. A phobia is an irrational and unthinkable or unthinking kind of fear, an emotional terror, I guess is a good way to put it. 
These people were afraid of their own shadows at the moment. <laughs> I guess sort of, sort of like seeing monsters in the closets or a boogeyman under the bed. Well, maybe not literally, but they were not thinking in a, in a rational way. Their world had been turned upside down and inside out. You know, they had left their families, they'd left their jobs, their lives, their livelihoods to follow this charismatic healer and preacher. And now this glorious revolution, it had come to a screeching halt. The wheels had come off the kingdom of God parade. The movement had collapsed and all was in disarray. If you want to know what what they look like, well, just think about the TV images of a favorite team in the NCAA bracket, uh, basketball tournament that loses, while the winners are jumping around and high-fiving one another and celebrating the losers. Where do you see them? They're huddled on the bench. All their hopes, all their dreams, everything smashed. And they just sort of sit there, staring out into space, or else they hide their face under towels, not wishing to weep on national TV. Well, the gospel march had come to an inglorious, confusing, disarrayed halt. The season was over, and the Jesus team was left fearful, confused, inept, clueless, trying to find a way to make sense out of everything that had happened. And Jesus, the risen Christ, came into that locked room. And he brought to them the things they needed to recover and to go forward. He brought them a third-class ticket on the Kingdom of God Express. First of all, he gave them the peace that passes all understanding. Jesus came to them in their fear, and the very first words out of his mouth are, Peace be with you. This greeting is very important. And he repeated, repeated it actually three times in our gospel text. The scriptural words here are shalom and irene. And they mean completeness, welfare, health, a, a state in which everything is as it should be, as well as harmonized relationships between God and humanity. Jesus comes into the midst of these unharmonic and incomplete individuals and gives them the gift of being at peace with themselves and with the world. And this peace is a most mysterious thing, for you see, it is not tied to nor dependent upon any kind of external circumstances. It's not linked to how well you are doing in your job or how well you're getting along with your family or how much money's in the bank or how much upheaval and uncertainty there is in the world in which you live. It is a peace, a peace that descends upon and resides in their hearts and their spirits as a gift of grace from God. Now, after Jesus comforted the disciples, after he calmed their fears with his peace, Jesus gave them their third-class ticket. As the Father has sent me, even so, I send you. You see, Jesus came to this disheartened and directionless group, and he, he gave them once again a reason for living. He defined for them a purpose, laid out for them their future, and he put, he put in front of them their mission, this ministry. When Jesus showed them his wounds, it was not just a way of identifying himself or proving to them that, hey, it's, it's, really, it's really me. In showing them his wounds, his scars, Jesus also showed them who they were and what they were to do. And suddenly the things that Jesus said or had said 
began to make sense. Things like take up your cross and losing one's life for the gospel. Things that seem so peculiar when he said them. Well, all of a sudden, all of a sudden began to shout out their meaning to them as the disciples stare at his wounds. Uh, sort of like the light bulb comes on. Now I get it, they think, and now I understand. We are called to serve the world, to live for the world, to die for the world if necessary, because that's what Jesus did. This is what Luther meant when in his list of the seven marks of the church, and let me share those seven marks just quickly, the word, baptism, communion, forgiveness, ministry, worship, the cross. Luther said the last one, the cross, was the most important. This mark of the church is like the scar in Jesus's hands and feet and body. It is signs of the church's willingness to suffer with and for the world. Our embrace of the cross on behalf of others, you see, is our third class ticket on the gospel line. And so in closing, Jesus, you see, gave the final and best gift of all. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. God provides. God provides what is needed to fulfill God's purposes. And that's not the same thing as saying that God gives us power. God works through sometime, our, our, our sometimes feeble efforts to accomplish God's will in this world. And this is shown to us in Christ on the cross, which was not an exercise of power, but it was a demonstration of humility and obedience and faith. God's promise is to fill us with the Holy Spirit, to provide for us that which is needed so that we may do what we are called to do. Oh, my friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you now to join me in the prayers of the church. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Open the doors we close, O God, when we fear the uncertainties and difficulties that this world brings our way. Open the doors we close, O God, and guide us to work for unity and harmony with our neighbors so that we may come to respect and cherish our commonalities. Open the paths we ignore, O oh God, when we make our priorities and desires far more important than what you in your cross reveal to us as your will and the way of ministry. Inspire all to care for one another and the world, the world that you have made so that all living things might indeed thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the rooms we lock, O oh God, to the peace that you so graciously offer to our troubled hearts and minds. Help us to recognize your presence and power in the midst of our pain. Open the hearts we close, O oh God, to the cries of, of those who are in pain. We pray for those isolated physically or emotionally through incarceration, addiction, mental illness, chronic suffering, grief, quarantine, and all who are in need. We pray for those on the front lines risking their own safety and service to others. 
We pray for those who have no employment, with no access to health care, and for those living with disease. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the ways of love, O God, in the pursuit of peace throughout this world, and bless the efforts of missionaries, health care professionals, and relief workers, especially those who find themselves in harm's way. As you have opened the way to eternal life through the cross, O God, we remember those who have died in faith. Free us from the fear of death, that we may embrace the peace you have promised. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And with bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power, now and forever. Amen. And receive this blessing. Almighty God, Father, risen Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. May God keep you safe. Take care. I will see you soon, hopefully.